Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this year's Bajan Conference after one two year break, well, one year when we didn't have one, and one year when we had one online. We're finally back to a face to face meeting. So I'm happy to see you here and uh, in uh, large numbers. Uh, so before we start, I'd like to ask the newly elected director of this institute, Dr. Schitz, to uh, give us some welcoming words. So good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you here at the Bajan Conference for PhD students. Uh, for some of you, I guess it's the first experience, first experience with the public presentation of the results. For some of us, maybe it's a routine. Uh, but I would like to stress that the presentation of the results uh, in between a scientific community as well as the society is, uh, I think, a very important part of your work, because in my opinion, there is nearly no value with the results if they are only in your mind. So it's uh, really crucial to disseminate the results of your, of your activities and of the science. So I will not speak uh, longly. I would like to thank also to Magda and her team for organizing of this conference. And I would like to wish you also good luck in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for those words. Um, before we start, I'll... Um, continue with some of the technicalities of, of this meeting. So as you know, we've learned something from, uh, from the emails I've been sending around, but um, let me summarize all of this. Uh, this conference is organized by the PhD studies board of this institute, of which I have the privilege uh, of being the chair. Uh, and the uh, PhD studies board is here. Uh, myself, Dr. Vladimir Jimal, uh, Dr. Uh, Jaroslav Tihon, Dr. Karel Sokup, and Dr. Radek Feiger. Uh, uh, all of us uh, will be uh, the jury of this meeting. For today, it's only uh, us. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be joined by some external members. Like, we're trying to uh, decrease the bias that we could have by knowing you. Uh, and so, as you know, this uh, conference will be a contest. And in each category, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, uh, we will try to pick winners of those of you who have the best presentations. Uh, the best presentation is judged uh, by uh, the quality of the presentation, the quality of the scientific work, and of course, um, the quality of your English also, but that's, let's say, uh, one of the minor things, because this is, the, this is something that you should do on your English exams. So that's for the uh, contest part. Of course, this should be taken by you uh, as, to, um, uh, as an opportunity to go at each other's throats, but uh, rather as an opportunity for you to grow and to see and to, uh, how others measure up to you or how you measure up to others. And uh, please remember, even if you fail, it doesn't mean that uh, you're bad or you're not good enough. Uh, even if you fail, uh, it means that someone was maybe better than you or you had a bad day, that's all. And you can, be, uh, you can, you can succeed the next year. Um, you have these little abstract books, which are all around here. You can take one, this is, this is free, uh, there's a box. Uh, at the end, if, if there's not enough of the abstract books on, on the tables. Uh, the abstract book has an ISBN number, so this is a, uh, this is a, uh, a publication that you can cite and use in your yearly assessments at your universities. Um, we've edited this, so you know the process. This is really, we try to put in some effort, so we try to correct your English and to make sure that the figures are good. So, so this is something also for you to learn something from, hopefully. Uh, so take the abstract books, take the programs, um, 
during coffee breaks, refreshments will be served in the kitchenette so we can get coffee and hopefully some sweets, which hadn't arrived before we started. So hopefully they will arrive uh, by the first coffee break. So I think that's all from me. Good luck to all of you. Um, uh, I'll give the floor over to Yarda Tihon, who will be chairing the first session. So that's uh, a short note. Yes. Uh, I have a short note. I'm today's photographer instead of Benik uh, Wagner, who is not available today. So don't be nervous. <laughs> okay. Um, true. Um, I'll just set up the first presentation. So welcome everybody to our first morning session. We have all together for presentation on various topics, starting from mem membranes over the waste, uh, waste, and finally the hydrodynamic habitation. It will be presented mostly by the students in the second year, if I go. We can start with the first presentation given by Jan Cizek, and it will be about the Kirao membrane. We have the pointer somewhere. Okay, so do I need to switch? Try to use something. I will try to use a lot. Find something on the table. It will be possible to bring some. Yeah. Uh, Maybe a good idea. Does someone have a pointer? Um, Okay, never mind. Dear colleagues, dear members of the jury, uh, it is my pleasure to open this conference uh, with my contribution. My name is Ken Cijek, and I am second year PhD student under the supervision of uh, Dr. Pavel Izak. And today, uh, well, my, my main topic of, of my PhD thesis is a uh, separation of racemic compounds using membranes. And today I would like to present you some preliminary results achieved in one of the projects that I've been lately working on. And first, uh, let me outline a bit uh, the, the goals of this work in the first place. And then I should tell you a bit about the racemic mixture separations because I'm aware that maybe not all of you are familiar with this topic. And I should also explain why we should even care to separate these. And then we will move on to the experimental path where I will show you the experiments and the results. And then I will conclude the presentation with a few concluding points, and uh, I will tell you something about our future goals too. So the goal of this uh, of this work is to prepare a chiral functional membrane that will be able to separate an antiomers from uh, water water based solutions, and uh, this membrane should be prepared in a way so that it's. Uh, basically done by through electrostatic interactions between a uh, charged commercial available, commercially available membrane and charged chiral solids. And then we should also, uh, of course, characterize the membrane experimentally. Now, you might think that this is quite obvious. This is quite easy. This is not really novel, but quickly. Thank you. Try quickly. Uh, but, Looking into the papers, I wasn't really able to find many, if any, papers concerning or exploring and discussing this topic of uh, electrostatic, uh, let's say, interaction between the membranes and uh, the functional layer. So I think this might be interesting, and that's why I chose the topic. Uh, but first, as I said, let's explain a bit about the racemic compounds. Uh, well, you probably know what racemic compounds are. If not, they are just mixtures of enantiomers where enantiomers are organic molecules that are same in the number and type of atoms they consist of. However, they are uh, simply put a bit spatially uh, differently oriented. It is just like our two hands. When you take a look at your hands, they are composed of the same number and type, type of fingers. But when you put them behind each other, you can see that there is something that doesn't align really. And it is, it is very similar with enantiomers. Uh, because they are so chemically similar, it, uh, it is also a reason for them, them having uh, almost the same chemical and physical properties that is in non chiral environment. Uh, however, when we put them into a chiral environment, well, okay. When we put them into a chiral environment, uh, 
This is when the things start, start to change a little bit because they can interact differently with other chiral molecules. And our body is a chiral environment. It is full of these chiral recognition sites. And it means that when you put your drug or, or some organic molecule as chiral into your body, it really matters which enantiomer is put into the body. And with drugs, it is, it is very, very this case because a lot of the drugs are still manufactured as uh, racemic mixtures, mixtures of the two enantiomers. However, as it was in case in 1950s, 1960s with a drug called thalidomide, it can be very harmful because thalidomide was administrated to pregnant women to reduce their morning sickness. But soon it was found that the children that were then born to these women uh, were somehow, somehow damaged. And it was found that one of the enantiomers is teratogenic, which is a big problem, of course. But since, since these uh, drugs and uh, substances are, are so uh, chemically similar, uh, it is difficult to separate them. And what is difficult is usually also expensive, right? So let's take a look how we do this. Well, using membranes, is good because membranes are easily scalable. I mean, membrane processes in general, they have big capacity and uh, that's, why, that's why we choose them to, to, at least we try to do this procedure using membranes. But to need to separate the chiral compounds using membranes, you need a chiral membrane. And a chiral membrane is basically a membrane uh, to which we have to introduce somehow the optical activity or, or the chiral recognition sites. And, as you can see here, this is a membrane which we functionalized with our chiral recognition sites. And then this membrane is able to stop one of the enantiomers and leave the other, other enantiomer basically uh, pass, pass the membrane. Uh, for the chiral selectors, there are many, many kinds where the inspiration is taken mostly from chromatography. And uh, cyclodextrins, which are these molecules, are one of the most favorites. These are oligosaccharide molecules shaped in a conical way so that they form this cavity inside them. And this cavity is, of course, uh, spatially somehow limited uh, and is hydrophobic, has some uh, functional groups around it. And this cavity was also found to be uh, an anti selective, which is why we call this molecule a chiral selector and we can use it for chiral separations. In this work, as I said, it's about electrostatic interactions. So we chose uh, this uh, beta cyclodextrin, which is functionalized with a sulfur group. And this sulfur group is highly acidic, and mean, meaning it's negatively uh, charged in the wide range of pH. And so how we did the membrane is then very easy procedure. Uh, we just took commercially available anion exchange membrane, which is positively charged. We soak this membrane into a bottle, basically of a solution with, uh, of aqueous solution of these uh, sulfur bottle ether beta cyclodextrins. And through this, let's say, dip coating technique, we can obtain membrane coated with our chiral selectors on the surface. Uh, I don't have the time to go into detail here, but yeah, we can, of course, prove that it, it really happens and it, that it's stable. Uh, then what we do is we take the membrane and we put it into our diffusion cell. This membrane splits the cell into, into two compartments where once one of them is filled with our racemic mixture. In, in this case, this was a tryptophan mixture of enantiomers and uh, we fill the other part of the cell with pure solvent, in this case, water. We let the enantiomers of the tryptophan diffuse through the cell, through the membrane and we sample uh, over time and uh, analyze using HPLC with uh, chiral column to see uh, how the concentration of each of the enantiomers evolved over time. Here you can see the results we obtained. And you can see that in the slide blue, uh, this is L-tryptophan, and its concentration decreased over time much more than of the D-tryptophan, which is in that group. Uh, this is on the retentate or let's say feed side on this side where we fill the solution for, in the first place. And in the permeate side, which is behind the membrane, let's say, we can see almost none to none in the end to L-tryptophan. However, we can see the concentration of D-tryptophan to be, to be increasing. Uh, this is because the membrane is sorption selective. The membrane uh, is selective towards sorption of L-tryptophan 
which is then like I said, solved into the membrane while the D-tryptophan is only uh, its retention to its, or, or the retention to the uh, D-tryptophan is not that high. And you can see that most of it is left in the solutions on the sides of the cell. Uh, but of course, we have some charges there. We have uh, amino acid that is through the ionic. And so we said, what happens when we change the pH, right? Because it's the good question to ask. And Tryptophan is the ionic, meaning that below a certain pH, that is 2.4 approximately in this case, the tryptophan will be positively charged, and above, above 9.4, it should be more or less uh, negatively charged. And so we changed the pH to these, these values, to 2.1, 10.6. And what you can see here first in this, in this picture is that nothing much really happened when the pH was uh, 2.1. The sorption wasn't really uh, that high, and we couldn't see much separation. While in the 10.6 pH, you can see that there is something interesting happening, and that is the concentration of the tryptophan decreased pretty quickly. However, still there wasn't really uh, separation to be seen. But uh, it's interesting, at least, to see that it responds to to the pH now. And uh, to conclude, uh, as I said, the only only pH region, or let's say pH, was the pH of water, where, where we could uh, observe really the separation happening. However, the effect of the separation was quite high. You could see that it took uh, nearly seventy days for it to happen, and I will I will go uh, into it in a bit. But uh, as I said, we couldn't see really any changes. Uh, of the pH having effects on the separation. And how to solve the 70 days problem? Well, of course, we, we want to try and need to try different membranes too, because the support is the thing that uh, alters or has the substantial effect on the permeation on the fluxes through the membrane. And this membrane we used was very thick. It was 500 microns or so, which is, which is very thick. But there are, of course, different ion exchange membranes, which we are trying right now, and we'll try for better, better results. We also want to look into a characterization of the functional layer a bit more, because it's tricky. It's very thin layer, and, uh, but it can be done somehow. Uh, the ultimate goal of this project is to prepare what we call <coughs> the electrolyte membranes which are membranes uh, that are basically the substrate is functionalized layer by layer using the oppositely charged chiral, chiral selectors. You deposit one, one layer of, let's say, negatively charged uh, selectors, and then you can deposit a layer of uh, the opposite charge. And in this way, we can finally tune the thickness and, uh, let's say, the selectivity, hopefully, of the, of the functional layer. And that's it. I thank you for your attention. I'm open for questions. Uh, could you please compare this method based on membrane separation with uh, preparative chromatography, which is a well developed method for racemic yeah. mixture separation, even at industrial scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's in preparative scale, it's, it's usually used for detection and. Uh, yeah, really to see what are the enantiomers, where are they, how, how is the concentration of the enantiomers, detection of the enantiomers, or recognition, let's say. Um, in large scale, it's not usually done through these techniques, because the, I mean, at least for the drugs that have been developed as enantiomerically pure compounds, there are different techniques of biosynthesis, stuff like that. Uh, but uh, with membranes, uh, membranes can be applied because, or at least we hope can, they can be applied in the future because they are universal, I know. You just need to modify your membrane well and in a clever way, and then you should be able. But uh, this is also in preparative scale only. So far, membranes haven't been used uh, in, in the industry for, at least not for, of course, for the chiral separations. Based on my other question. Um, what will happen when all these uh, selector sites are occupied by the molecules? 
can you regenerate, regenerate the membrane uh, somehow yeah. to get rid of all the other energy which is sort of you mean so uh, when, when the chiral recognition sites are occupied by the yeah. racemic or, or the enantiomer of the racemic ones are uh, yeah that is a good question of course and yeah there are ways to decrease because uh, the way the enantiomer, enantiomer is bound to the selector is mostly through non-covalent interactions and uh, so then by change of solvents and change of condition in the pH you can uh, release hopefully the tryptophan or in this case tryptophan but other compounds also from the from the chiral selector into into the solution like you can use uh, yeah depends you, you have to play with pH and you have to play with the solvents not yet not yet but we're interested to do so Congratulations to a very nice lecture <laughs> and presentation of your results. Uh, let me put uh, two questions. What's the effect of uh, solvent and temperature of the separation? Also a good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it all depends on where your uh, racemic compound is soluble, in which solvent it is soluble. Uh, in this case, amino acids, mostly water or methanol. But uh, we try really to stay with one solvent now, then we will move to, to the other solvents. Uh, but for example, when you compare methanol and acetonitrile, which are different sol solutions uh, or solvents used in chromatography for different applications, uh, because they reduce or increase the strength of your, uh, let's say, mobile phase. So I'm not an expert in chromatography, but uh, yeah. So we expect the same to happen to happen with the recognition of the uh, enantiomers too. And regarding the temperature, uh, since there are many uh, hydrogen bonds uh, involved in this, especially with the cyclodextrins, we expect that when the temperature drops to eight degrees, it could increase the, the strength of the bond. While when we increase the temperature, it, it, it should uh, decrease the strength of the uh, of the bond and yeah we, we just built we just built a setup to be able to control the temperature in the cells so that's hopefully in the fall i i hope that we will try to do it. thank you okay, thank you for the explanation and once more for presentation thank you also, a second presentation given by could you please share your screen first? Not share, sorry. Uh, no, it's not. It's not share. Uh... Of course. Share screen. Just share the PowerPoint. Okay, then I will share PowerPoint. That's why it's not shared. Okay. And then yes. Okay. Now let's go. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Good morning. My name is Matija Gusek, and today I would like to speak about the PFAS remover from the Swiss sludge by the pyrolysis. What are these PFAS? These PFAS compounds that that are like per and polyfluor acryl substance. I will use PFAS because it's much easier for me during my presentation. And they are a persistent organic substance with carbon four bonds. Uh, due to these bonds, which is one of the strongest in the chemistry, they are really persistent in the environment. There are more than 5,000 different species and they are highly used in the industry due to the fact that they have really uh, different variables and valuable uh, properties as like chemical and thermal stability, uh, hydrophobicity, oleophobicity, good thermal conductivity, or non flammability Due to this fact, we can find them in different industrial sector, textile industry, food packaging. Every time when you take pizza on the pizza package, there are PFAS, different type of PFAS, which are uh, good for the food packaging. Uh, we can find them also in the sports equipment, different plastic plastics or the textile, like the Gore-Tex membrane or the different types of membrane. Uh, 
from this point of view, it looks like that they are really uh, valuable. But unfortunately, there is one problem, and that's that uh, some of them can cause some uh, health risk. Uh, in the point of view of the cancer, they can involve the, uh, the cholesterol levels, they can involve the unborn child in the body of mother, or the cause the change in the endocrine organs. So there are problems, and how they can get in the environment. They can get in the environment through the sewage sludge. This we figure it out, this uh, sewage sludge and people are problematic due to uh, the review, which I pu publicate this year together with my colleagues. And we found that there is kind of research gap in this topic because they are missing data about PFAS behavior during the pyrolysis. There are very big demand for the uh, actual data operation. And we figure it out that it's not some kind of hot topic of 2022, but it's topic which is uh, research in different sectors, uh, mainly in food industry, textile industry, water industry, cosmetics, and we just joined uh, this research graph with our sludge. It's also a big problem for the European Union because as I show you, there is a problem with the, this health risk. So the European Union uh, searching for the research uh, to prepare some restrictions, some bans, uh, to the PFAS due to the problems uh, which can cause. And nowadays we have different limits already in sewage sludge which can be used in the uh, agriculture in Germany and also in Denmark where there are some recommendations. So in Germany and Denmark there is problem, but it's also a problem in Czech. There is no problem in Czech in the legislation, but in the real sludge from, uh, there are the problems. This is a graph from my colleagues from the uh, Professor Zenheimer Research Group, which published uh, the research on the amount of PFAS in the sludge. Here is the eight different sludge, sludges from the large wastewater treatment plants. That means more than uh, 50,000 equivalent inhabitants. And in the eight sludge, oh, sorry, in four sludge from eight, there is the bigger amount of PFAS than it's possible to use in uh, Germany. So this problem also, for us, for the Czech, we don't care, but it's a problem. So, and there is a uh, pressure to start to do it with it, something. So we made the experiment, our, that was the target of my year this year, and we was trying to determine the minimum temperature for the sufficient removal of the PFAS. We used one of the Czech sludge from the uh, ordinary wastewater treatment plant uh, from the medium city from three, 30,000 uh, equivalent, in, equivalent inhabitants uh, with wide distribution of PFAS. And we settled different temperatures, and that's the difference between uh, uh, other research that we start in the low temperature and we end in the medium temperature paralysis to settle the, the best value and also say that, for example, the torrification or medium ter temperature paralysis is not good. I will show you the results later. So that was the plan, so put like the maximum amount of different temperature and figure it out which is best and which is not a good idea uh, to, to use because there are different ways how to treat the sewage sludge uh, by the pyrolysis. We analyzed 37 different PFAS and we analyzed them in the sludge chart and the pyrolyzed condensate from uh, absorbed in the acetone. Uh, our experiment apparatus, it was based on the uh, oven in which was steam, uh, stainless steel a reactor and the uh, input gas was helium and output gas, the pyrolysis condensate was absorbed in the wash plants and then the, absor uh, then the condensate was uh, analyzed for the, for the PFAS. When I will show you results, uh, the internal concentration was 200 uh, for nano nanograms per gram. Uh, we was able in the, uh, the temperature 400 degrees Celsius to, to remove more than 99% of uh, uh, PFAS. So the sufficient temperature was 400 uh, Celsius. Uh, it was also possible to see that there was not cleavage of PFAS. It means that from the, the PFAS which we analyzed, there was a not new, new one. It can happen that they are like cleavage, like the, from the long chain, then chain the, for, the, for the small one. And this 
we didn't observe or it wasn't observed. Also, uh, there was found uh, the high persistence of 5 to 3 FTA. It's one of the PFAS uh, in the condensate, which we don't know yet. And it's like my job from July and June. Uh, and it's subject of nowadays discussion or my discussion was I'm doing. Uh, now, we are also able to validate this data because since 2020 in Czech Republic, there is first uh, pyrolysis units in Trutnov in operation. So that's why it was for us important also to know like the, uh, the results for uh, the real operations. And so the PFAS from Trutnov was measured in input series slash and in the slash R. And it was, it was also possible to conclude or say as a result that in its function also in the real, oper uh, real operation scale. From the intellect concentration, 101 nanograms per gram, it, was, it is removed more than 99% also, and the N concentration of PFAS in the sewage sludge, which is produced in the industry scale, it's 1.3 1, 1. nanogram per gram. Also, the, the sludge was analyzed again for 37 different PFAS. Uh, then I would like to conclude my presentation. I would like to say that uh, the sufficient temperature for the removal of PFAS was 400 degree, but there is one but one, however, that uh, it's not enough the temperature for uh, the normal or like the valuable sustainable uh, operation of normal industry uh, scale pyrolysis units. That's why we say that the 500 uh, Celsius is required, required. And that's why that we uh, are in my research group, we already know that, that there is a, uh, also problems with different organic pollutants, which need higher, uh, higher uh, temperature for removal. The sludge, sludge quality increased with the higher temperature and also to keep energy balance in the profit amount. The continuation of this work, it's uh, finished the discussion, focus on the cleavage and occurrence of PFAS in condensate. And at the end of the summer, publicate this uh, work in some uh, Q1 journal. I would like to thank you also my colleagues from the uh, University of Chemistry and Technology and from the uh, Institute of Microbiology from Czech Academy of Science who collaborate with this research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation and the question. I'm not sure if I got it right. There are some regulations for PFAS in EU or not? Sorry, where? There are some regulations for PFAS in EU. In EU, like in the European Union, uh, they are not. But some member states, which are Germany, they have a legislation limits, and in uh, Denmark they have the recommendations. And in Czech Republic. And it. Why they would like to do it? Because in Czech Republic. Because there are no regulations. Because do this. Because th this is the problem. Because we are using the sludge in the agriculture, and we need limits because the PFAS are here. They are like uh, can get spread in the environment and cows if they get in the food chain. They can be problem with this, so it's kind of to be sure that we don't harm ourselves or our nature. So the result of your work should be somehow like support for to build a new regulation or something. Also, and support like the use of pyro, pyro sorry, and support the use of pyrolysis units mm -hmm. uh, due to the fact that they are sufficient, sustainable for this uh, sewage sludge treatment due to the fact that you have to just. Uh, settle at the minimum temperature. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I missed the, the information. What is the aim? So to, to transfer the fluorine-based compounds to char or no? The aim is to determine the minimum temperature for the sufficient removal of the PFAS to say they are not in the slide chart. Yes. What okay. is the final product? of the fluorine compounds in that case uh, will be defined. HF, they are like they are changing for the 
or fluorine acid? Hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid, yeah. Uh -huh. If there's like just sufficient, sufficient. Uh, there is big demand or non demand. There's a big research gap that we actually, the researchers don't know what is at the end of the chimney. There is like, that's like what the researcher thinks it happens, but uh, there is not uh, like sufficient amount of papers which say if you uh, thermally treat the PFAS, what's happened at the end with that. That's what it's the, the research thing is happen, and also they can be different compounds. They can be also different PFAS because it's then more than the five thousand of them. Yeah. So that can be different different plants with shorter chains, for example, which it's not possible to analyze today, or we don't have the validated yeah. methods for them. Or they can be different fluorine organic compounds which are not analyzed. So but, that's like one. But, of, but you suppose that. Just, very important part will be in the form of hydrofluoric acid, primary gas. I like I, I can't I can say that I think or I but I don't uh, there is no data about it. I know that what I can say that in, if you treat the series slide for more than 400 degree, it's a safe material for the amount of the point of view what I present to you now. But what is after in a chimney, uh, I can say because there is no no research, no, no data about it. Yeah, and also, also, excuse me. Uh, so it means it is difficult to analyze hydrofluoric acid? No, it is difficult to analyze the, the PFAS. They are not, it, it is easy to uh, say that the hydrophobic acid, uh, fluorine acid is there. It's easy, but it's not, uh, you are not for 100% sure that there are not other PFAS, that it doesn't cleavage for different <laughs> compounds. So this, this is difficult to have validation methods for these 5,000 different pieces to say there is nothing. And this is, this is how there are not any PFAS in the Okay, and one more question, maybe I misunderstood. Here you say that you use sewage sludge with 204 nanograms per gram, but then the one of the last slides you started with 101 nanograms per gram. This was another experiment? Or was yeah, this was our. A laboratory experiment, uh -huh. and this we validate of the data. Uh, this was the kind of validation that is uh, this is uh, exists in the real operation scale because there is just five or six different uh, scale in the European Union which focus on the series slash, and these data are missing. So that's why we uh, put it together to show that it's functioning in laboratory scales and it's function also in the uh, real operation scales. Thank you. And just short last question. Do you have some comparison with the results, some other laboratories on the yes. effect of the temperature? It's in the agreement or yes, it is. It's kind of, uh, we, we don't have we have just on the sun because uh, nobody was focusing on the slow temperature. Uh, but we have the results from 500 uh, degree Celsius and 70 or 800 degrees Celsius. And this I would like this would be possible for me to uh, like discussed in my paper. So there are some results, but without the uh, deep methodology or deep discussion why it happened. So that's what will be different with, in our research. Thank you once more. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, today I would like to introduce you my topic and its analysis of textile waste prints in the Czech Republic. Uh, firstly, some words about presentation structure. Um, I will uh, say some words about impacts of textile industry, and today I will focus on toxicity of textile products. Then I will briefly mention a circular economy action plan, and I will finish with data and figures about textile waste treatment in the Czech Republic. 
Uh, I'm working on several projects, which I will introduce you more in detail later. And there are several main aims of my project. Uh, the first one is to determine the current state with textiles and textile waste streams in the Czech Republic. Afterwards, uh, to create a material flow analysis. And uh, finally, with the achieving of two main uh, first aims to optimize textile waste treatment and collection system in the Czech Republic. Uh, there are several problems that are related to um, textile industry and to textile waste in general. Uh, for example, it's natural resource consumption and problems with recycling. Uh, but today I would like to focus on uh, chemical releases from textiles. So I created a schema that is divided into two parts. And the first part is everyday use and the second part, the usage after disposal. And for example, if we have a look on the first part, everyday use, uh, textile fibers release uh, different chemicals uh, while washing and after wastewater treatment, all these chemicals are not all of them, but big part of these chemicals uh, accumulating in, in sludge and not only decrease uh, the quality of the sludge, but also afterwards, after applying of this sludge, uh, accumulating in aquatic system and soil. Um, also, if we speak about disposal, all these chemicals can go to the air and with skin surface, inhalation go uh, to human body and accumulate in lungs, kidneys, livers, and other important uh, human organs. Uh, here I collected uh, the most common chemicals uh, that can be used uh, to produce only one textile product, for example, a t-shirt. Um, I don't have enough time to introduce you all uh, and go through all of these um, chemicals. But for example, uh, if we speak about most common ones, among them belong dioxins that are used in dyes and pigments and, for example, cause the damage of the immune system, uh, cause issues with reproductive and development of human's body and can lead to cancer. Uh, if I have a look on formamide uh, that is used in cleaning solvents and as an antifungal agent, uh, for example, in sports clothes, mostly uh, it can cause liver dysfunction and reproductive problems. So it's obvious that uh, textile industry and textile waste is a problem. So uh, textiles became a part of circular economy action plan uh, that was adopted by the commission uh, on the 11th of March of the year 2020. Uh, the aim of this plan is the transition of the European economy from a linear to a circular model. Uh, the aim of this plan is to achieve cleaner, climate neutral, resource efficient and competitive economy. And this action plan to be implied into the legislation of each member state, including Czech Republic. So because of it in the year 2021, the waste treatment law appeared in the Czech Republic and new waste streams uh, need to be solved. Among uh, these new waste streams uh, belong not only the textile waste, but for example, uh, bio waste, uh, lithium batteries, and others. And uh, we are responsible as a part of uh, the work project for. Um, for achieving these goals. Uh, the Vogue project is a center for environmental research. And uh, on this project are working not only our department, but uh, UCT, Charles University, and other uh, research organizations. And uh, there are two main aims in the connection with all new waste streams. Uh, the first one is uh, to collect relevant data about these new waste streams, and the other aim is to uh, achieve uh, ambitious recycling goals of circular economy action plan for the Czech Republic. Uh, here I would like to introduce uh, textile waste flows from the year 2019. Uh, I have here a generalized schema uh, which starts with material input, uh, for example, fibers or important garments that 
go through processing, uh, through retailers and local consumers' hands, and afterwards, uh, two main uh, textile waste streams appear. The first one is industrial textile waste, and the second one, post consumer textile waste. And we will have a look on them in detail. Uh, so, about industrial textile waste. Uh, it consists of subcategories like fabric waste, material waste, rejected component waste, and waste, waste from packaging materials. I ad identified uh, all these types from uh, base treatment catalog. And uh, according to the official data, uh, and it's not surprising that uh, big amount of this waste goes to recycling. It's not surprising because industrial textile waste mostly uh, has known composition, so it's really suitable for recycling. On the other hand, for us it was surprising that still really big amount of this waste go for landfilling and uh, it will change uh, with new waste treatment law, because from the year 2025, uh, it, uh, from the year 2025 will be a mandatory for uh, collecting of textile waste, and from the year 2030, it's gonna be a ban for uh, landfilling of usable materials, uh, including textile waste. So our next goal for industrial textile waste, we have almost uh, all um material flow data about this type of waste but we want to uncover uh more in detail why so big amount of textile waste go for landfilling uh here i have post consumer textile waste and the first thing uh that was surprising that uh lots of a big amount of this waste go for recycling because comparing to industrial textile waste this waste is much more heterogenic, so um, mostly it's not so suitable for recycling, but according to the official statistics, a uh, big part of it goes for recycling and rather small amount for landfilling or incineration. But here we have another problem. We don't know for sure uh, how many, um, uh, how much uh, textile waste uh, after uh, post consumers go to developing countries, uh, to charities, and from charities afterwards to secondhand shops for reuse and uh, for recycling. Uh, we created a questionnaire for uh, charities, but uh, cooperation with charities nowadays, uh, it's a little bit hard task that uh, we are solving now. So uh, we hope that in the nearby future, we will solve this problem and we will compare official statistics with the data that uh, charities uh, collected in uh, last years. Uh, I've also created a Sankey diagram for industrial textile waste and for post-consumer textile waste, where you can see that in the case of industrial textile waste, uh, predominant ways of uh, uh, treatment, waste treatment are recycling and landfilling, and for post-consumer textile waste, it's recycling. Uh, here I summarized uh, two, two waste flows, and for both of them, recycling is predominant way, it's about 56%, but still 30% uh, goes to landfilling, and that is a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, I have also compared uh, production of textile waste for industrial and post-consumer textile waste uh, in years 2010 and 2019. And as you can see that the amount of industrial textile waste is almost the same, but if you have a look on post-consumer textile waste, its amount in the year 2010 was about uh, 5,000 tons, and in the year 2019, it was about 38,000 uh, tons. Uh, I also compared uh, waste of uh, waste of uh, textile waste treatment for post-consumer uh, textile waste, and here we can see that, for example, for uh, recycling, uh, recycling really increased for post-consumer textile waste, and here we also uh, got data about 
import and uh, now I'm processing um, new, new data about imports. So we try to uncover why uh, it's so big amount of import in the Czech Republic. I've also compared uh, amount uh, of post-consumer textile waste uh, in kilograms per capita. And in 2010, it was uh, less than one kilogram. And in the year 2019, it was 2.2 kilograms. Uh, I did the same thing for industrial textile waste. And here we can see that a uh, big amount of this waste go for recycling, as I have already mentioned, but uh, still big amount also goes to incineration and for landfilling. Um, obstacles for recycling of textile waste in the Czech Republic uh, are lack of structured statistical data, lack of technologies for recycling and consumer shopping behavior that is connected with fast fashion, and uh, these obstacles need to be solved, uh, we hope, uh, with the help of uh, our project. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm open for your questions. Thank you for the presentation and the question on your first scheme. You had something like the, the emissions to the air from the textile industry are also a very important part. Um, in which form they are uh, emitted uh, emissions and what kind of emissions are they from the textile industry? I am not like fully in this topic, but after after incineration, some takes, uh, some chemicals go to the air, and uh, um, soluble soluble chemicals are uh, accumulated in water and sludge. But like I am not, uh, I'm more about collecting and analyzing data. So I, I've just started with the topic of chemical releases of textiles. I uh, would like to ask, maybe I just missed it, but uh, when, I, when I read the uh, topic of your lecture, I, I was somehow expecting also to hear something about the production process and the ways coming out of production of textiles. So it's also part of interest or in future for example because for the statistic data uh, it's, it's industrial textile waste is a part of the waste that goes after uh market or after use of no, uh, after usage is post consumer textile waste that local uh consumers like you and me produce but this industrial textile waste is the waste after production so while processing different fibers and you have like all subtypes like fabric waste material waste rejected components so it all it's that's all industrial so textile waste, waste water coming from the production no it's no included no it's material. it's only it's only about materials so like solid material. Yes, and according to Czech legislation, we need uh, to solve like the waste from wastewater treatment plants, uh, different air pollution. It's not counted uh, for uh, waste uh, industrial and uh, post-consumer textile waste treatment. Okay, I have a question. You have identified several programs with textile waste, and now what will be your scientific aim how we will proceed with your studies uh, my scientific aim is to uncover all, all missing points so that i showed you on the schemas and afterwards uh, we will we all, we are also collecting uh, like data about ways of recycling of textile waste that we need to introduce to uh, Czech Minister of Environment. So like our first aim now to uh, completely finish material flow analysis and is the aim for, for this year. Okay, so to uncover we'll all this. Only, not, not, no experiments, for example. Yes. 
but near both uh, provocative question to which countries is exported this <laughs> this uh, uh, textualized uh, to Germany and Austria only that on such uh from the data that I got now, it's mostly Germany and Austria. Yeah, and in these countries, there are uh, there are applied uh, technology for uh, uh, <laughs> for, uh, for transformation of the space. Uh, uh, they they just have like a better collection system and like different charities and like in general the quality. Uh, like of their material and material that they can uncover from from waste like better they have more uh recycling like better recycling capacities so because of it that they try to collect because like in the czech republic there are no recycling capacities at, at all so because of it like they they are transported to to other like more uh high economic development countries thank you so one more question. Okay, sorry. That is over. Sorry. Yes, it's the bar. Okay, the no. Click on the big uh, green lips. Oh, okay. And the picture. Now it works? Yeah, it works. Okay. Yeah, put it in presentation. Good, good. Okay, thanks. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Siri Sterba, and I'm the student of the second year of the PhD study on the chemical of the, univer of the, univers the University of the Chemical Technology in Prague. Uh, today, I would like to present to you some information from a field of the hydronomic cavitation. In the first part of the presentation, I would like to explain the hydronomic cavitation. And in the second part, I would like to talk a bit about our progress in this field. So what is the <clears throat> hydronomic cavitation? It's the phenomenon quite similar to evaporation. You can see pressure. Uh, temperature diagram on the left side. Uh, you can see three different phases which which exist in most compounds. For example, water. <coughs> you have liquid phase, and water, and when you evaporate the water, the, <coughs> the the change is made by the temperature, as you can see with this red arrow. But it, you can also make a vapor from the liquid by the pressure, by lowering the pressure. And this phenomenon is called the cavitation. Uh, generally, the cavitation is known as bad, pretty bad phenomenon, which can damage turbines, which are used uh, to move with the boats or, the, or they are also in water plants. And in our case, we are uh, trying to make the cavitation in a really uh, in a different way. We use this cavitation nozzle. <clears throat> uh, when the water flows through the nozzle, here is the constriction, and the water starts to evaporate due to lower pressure in the restriction. When the cavities are created here, they are traveling through the nozzle. In this part, the pressure is lower, so the cavity implodes in themselves. In pretty, it implodes pretty fast. So that's the basic about the cavitation. 
And now I would like to talk a bit about the beer where I would like to implement this phenomenon. So the beer brewing steps are mashing out, hop boiling, fermentation, packaging, and drinking in the end. Um, <laughs> The first step is meshing, which is actually mixing the malt with the water and extract the saccharides from the malt into the water. Then you filtrate the, uh, the malt out and the second, second step starts, which is called hot boiling. This is the part where we are trying to implement cavitation now. Uh, there is hop added in the boiling kettle and all the mixture boils and there is pretty important substances from the hops which are called which which are called the uh, alpha hop acids and they are making the beer bitter during the hop boiling they are isomerating and change in bitter substances and there is then there is fermentation of the product and two other steps in a field of beer brewing, we are trying to implement the cavitation to improve the extraction of saccharides and other compounds from a barley. Not barley, it's actually malt. Malt is, uh, malt is made from a barley. The second step is hot boiling, which I talked about in the slide before. And also the important step could be gluten removal because the hydrodynamic cavitation probably should be able to destroy the molecules of the gluten and split them in some smaller parts which are not that bad to people who are celiatic so they wouldn't have any problems from the beer uh, which was affected by the cavitation. And the last step could be wastewater pretreatment because the hydrodynamic cavitation could destroy some of the molecules, which are uh, pretty hard to take out of the wastewater. So now you can see our first experimental setup, which we have uh, built here in Academy. Uh, here you can see the pump, which, which should be strong enough to uh, to make pressure high enough to make high flow through the cavitation nozzle. Well, this is the setup with which we have like a year ago, and the, and that time I thought that we actually made the cavitation. It looked like a little bit white water, but few months after I discovered that it wasn't probably cavitation. It was just some uh, change in a uh, uh, change in the gases which have been uh, in the water. Later, we tried to implement the cavitation nozzle in real scale brewery in Research Institute of Brewing and Malting. Here you can see the scheme of the setup. There have been some problems with building the apparatus. It took a really, a really long time and one day I came and see the result and here you can see the vessel. Here is the pump which pumps the water through the uh, through the pressure sensor and here is the cavitation nozzle and here is the, the, the second pressure sensor. Well, this setup hasn't been the best and it wasn't as we wanted to, but it, one day it's just appeared there and we couldn't change it. So the first problem had been that after the cavitation nozzle is still one meter long and there is actually nothing in there because uh, the nozzle is, the construction in the nozzle is really small, so it never, we, we, we weren't able to achieve like have the a tube filled with the water so it didn't make the cavitation and the second problem had been that the pump had been not strong enough which I didn't know at that time so after these <laughs> experiments 
Here we can see our first experiment that we have made on this setup. And uh, here is the equation of the isomeration. This is the alpha hop acids, which should isomerate in two isomers. And here is the results of the experiments, which we have done at 70 degrees, where this molecule shouldn't isomerate at all. And the cavitation number, which is pretty high because of the pump, which have been quite weak. But I didn't know in that time that the pump should be strong, more strong. So we obtained the results of the experiments. And as you can see, here is the non-isomerated particles, and here are the isomerated particles, which is basically zero. So it didn't work at all. So we started to calculating or finding where is the problem. And when we calculated all the Bernoulli from the system, we made the characteristic of the pump and of the, the characteristic of the tube system. And we have found out that the nozzle, which is actually one centimeter long, make the same pressure loss as one kilometer of the tubes. So that means that normally if you have like normal pumps, which you use all around, they've got like one, two, three bars on output. But for our case, for our nozzle, we, we needed 10 bar pump, which looks like this. So we bought a better pump and we changed the experimental setup a bit. Last time the setup was, uh, was in here, the upper part, which you cannot see now. But in this case, we put the pump. Uh, here is the place for, for flow meter, pressure sensors, and here is the nozzle. Now the nozzle is lower than the vessel which stores the liquid. So we saw also the problem <coughs> that there was the, the tube after the nozzle have been filled wholly with the water. So the cavitation could work and make some results. Here you can see the plastic nozzle which we have made. Uh, here is the cavitation nozzle. Here is the picture in white and black. It is pretty visible. I'm not sure if you can see the bubbles, but it's the cloud in here. It's the same in here. Yeah, the, the cavitation bubbles are created in the restriction, and where when they are leaving the restriction, they are collapsing in themselves. And there's the power which should isomerate the uh, alpha acids. So we made the experiment one more. The cavitation was lower. In last time it was 0 0.4. Now it was it's 0 0.1, and the results are clearly visible that the isomeration have been done by the cavitation, not by the temperature, because those substances can isomerate due to temperature, but now we have we have com, com, we can compare it in the same conditions just with different cavitation numbers. So we definitely can say that the isomeration is done by the cavitation. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. So I have a question. Can, can you explain the, the physical origin of the forces which can damage the surface? Uh, it's probably because when the bubble collapses, there is a high amount of the temperature and pressures which, uh, which goes from the bubble when the system <laughs> wants to uh, narrow the pressure. So when the bubble is collapsing, it's affecting the molecules around. Maybe it can be connected somehow with surface pressure, no? <laughs> I think it's mostly a mechanical thing when the bubble is collapsing. Some other question. Uh, yeah, cavitation number. I'm not sure if I got the equation for it. Yeah, I got the equation for it here. Uh, it, it's the way how the cavitation is calculated, and there is a pressure out of the nozzle, 
pressure of the evaporation of the liquid which goes through the nozzle, uh, the density and the velocity which you are achieving here in the restriction. If the cavitation was high when it was 0 0.4, the cavitation wasn't so strong, it was basically nothing. But when we <clears throat> higher the velocity, which had been done by the pressure out from the pump, which is the pressure inlet in the nozzle, because the pump is in front of the nozzle. And when you have stronger pump, the pressure in the nozzle is higher. So the velocity in the nozzle is also higher. That results in lower pressure. Higher, higher water flow results in lower pressure. And when the pressure, pressure is low, uh, the water try to fix it or narrow it somehow, and the water starts to evaporate to lower the pressure in the nozzle. And how do you calculate the pressure out? I got the pressure sensor here, which actually tells me the kilopascals. But uh, in the real delivery, I think that it should be better to, let's say, uh, define the, the calibration number uh, from the pressure output from the um, from your pump, not the output uh, from the nozzle, because the different different design of the nozzle can give you a different uh, design, different uh, output pressure. Uh, it's two different things which are mixed here together. Uh, the pressure out from the pump doesn't affect the pressure out of the nozzle. The pressure in front of the nozzle, which is out of the pump, uh, affect the flow in the nozzle. But later, we added a gate valve in here. And when we are closing the valve, we are hiring the pressure out, mm -hmm. which is normally, normally it's atmosphere. But when we are closing the valve in here, we are uh, hiring the pressure out from the nozzle, which uh, which leads to higher cavitation number, which is actually a lower cavitation. A higher cavitation number means lower cavitation effects. Okay. Thank you. So, last short question. First question. In the beginning, you return to the diagram you showed us. And uh, just a technical comment. You spoke about changing temperature, but spoke about the red arrow, and then you spoke about changing pressure. And you describe the blue arrow, which would be, I think, the vice versa. Yeah, I just wish that. And uh, also, it would be better to use the same color, use the, the arrow at the entrance of the, of the nozzle, use the same uh, color of arrow that's used for the, for the pressure change and not for the temperature change. It's misleading for the, for the user. So, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's flow like water is normally blue, so that's why I <laughs> water. Okay. Thank you much. So